So uh, this is going to be a little different than the things that I've heard so far because I'm primarily a technology guy. Um, I helped set up the media lab at MIT. So I think about technology and how technology interacts with society. And of course, that gets you to privacy and things like that pretty quickly. So, so that's the, the angle that I'm coming from. And I, I hope it will be interesting um, because what I find is that most people don't have a good sense for where the technology is, and particularly where the technology is going. And I hope to impart a little of that uh, by giving you some, some different uh, views of this. And I talk about this big data society because um, today we all have cell phones. Everybody in this room has one. Everybody has a credit card. All of those things leave behind little digital breadcrumbs. They have to in order to be able to, to operate. It is the essence. So, so that exists, and we are not going to give up our credit cards and our cell phones. In fact, we shouldn't, because they do a lot for our society in terms of not just convenience, but quality, access, and emergency response. And I'll show you some more things. And so what we're at is a place where, with these sort of new tools, many of which we regard as really essential to our life, and I think I would argue are essential, particularly in the rest of the world, uh, perhaps more so than here, um, we have this trade-off between uh, public goods, personal goods, and private goods. We have to renegotiate a lot of what our particular uh, attitudes are about that, and we also have to be very careful about thinking about what are these trade-offs going to look like in 10 years, because things will be very different in 10 years. So let me give you a couple of, of examples. So about 20 years ago, um, everyone was suddenly woke up to the fact that there were going to be computers everywhere, and there was going to be some sort of wireless communication. This is before there was Wi-Fi, before there were laptops, before there were even the first experimental cell phones didn't exist. And what I did is I gathered a group of some 20 students together, and we built uh, little PCs that were powered by motorcycle batteries, and we had little head-mounted displays that were actually lasers that would shoot letters into your eyeballs. Uh, it was very strange, but it was a great way to explore what the future would be. Uh, and so this is a picture. Uh, you can sort of see it's, it's a little odd. The guy in the second from the left in the back there, he's the technical lead that created Google Glass. Now, we were about 20 years too early. We learned a bunch of things. The first thing we learned is nobody in the right mind wears stuff like this. <laughs> so I went to France and uh, got a fashion school interested in where was this wearable computing stuff go. And in 95, we had the world's first wearable computing fashion show in the Pompidou Center. Um, and the students designed things like these. So that thing that that sort of had there, um, you know, it's a display pad with a battery and wireless connections and a fingerprint reader. Sounds a lot like, you know, an iPhone 6, right? But you have to remember, no cell phone had ever been built at this point, right? And that sort of thing with a hook on the end there, that looks a lot like Google Glass. In fact, that's what it is, it's a, a head-mounted display. And, and so these students designed the future 20 years ago. We couldn't actually build this stuff. You'll notice, though, that uh, Samsung and Motorola and companies like that actually sponsored the research. So they were getting a, a picture into the future. So you could take a lot of what I'm saying in that day. It's not today, five years from now or ten years from now. Um, and one of the things that we learned that's really dramatically different, okay, and it will take you days, unless you're a lot smarter than I am, at least sort of digest it. Almost all the data we have about government, about human behavior, about psychology, and indeed about medicine is based on pitifully little data. Psychology is a bunch of undergrads taking surveys in a room like this. You know the term weird? Western, educated, and it turns out that all of our social sciences are based on a type of human, which we all are, which represent a couple percent of the entire population, 
And we are very different in all sorts of fundamental ways, including how we see. We, our, our visual illusions, the things we think are basic to our biology, are different than most of humanity. Because we were raised in these sorts of environments where most of humanity is. And so what we're beginning to do by having this sort of sensors on people, and that's the way to regard a, a cell phone. It's not just for communication. It's got sound sensors and location sensors, and, and it's got uh, movement sensors and things like that, and then kitchen is another thing. Suddenly, we have sensors on people 24-7 while they go through their normal life. And you can, for the first time, make a big data psychology, a big data sociology. You can learn about public policy in a way that has never been possible before. Most public policy is based on, oh, you know, well, when I was a kid back in that, you know, whatever, it worked this way, and I think that's you know, good enough for my grandpa. Yeah. We can actually do experiments. We can actually have data about these things continuously. And of course, when it comes to health and medicine, you know, most of medicine is based on acute care in an office, using measurements that are not you know, commonly available, like taking blood. You know, I don't get blood all the time. So, so it's very discreet. And when you begin making continuous measurements, it changes the science fundamentally. A friend of mine is the chief medical officer of, of, of uh, Mass General Hospital, and he points out that medicine is perhaps the only profession that doesn't know what it's getting it right. There is no standard for being healthy. We don't know what leads to health and what encourages health. And as you heard from several people here, the health industry is so, so broken up and fragmented that it's hard to know uh, what are treatments for diseases that are good, what are the things that it's just, you know, from, from a science point of view, it's a mess, okay? And I'm happy to stand up in front of all sorts of people and say that. I know that people work hard on it, but a lot of it is the lack of data and the lack of integration, okay? But that should also make you a little worried, right? because that integration of data is, in many ways, the biggest threat Fine. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. Let's see if we can make this work. Oh, no. <laughs> um, OK, so we're just going to talk about it. So the first thing I wanted to show you is a little movie of people moving around in San Francisco. So these are actually tax cabs moving around, but of course they're carrying passengers. You want to know where people go in San Francisco. Well, it turns out that you can cluster these things, and you define what you find is that um, there are these discrete subgroups in San Francisco, like there are in every city. And it's not the taxi cabs that are important, that's just where we got the data, right? Um, we get it from cell phones and credit cards and many other things. But these different subgroups are are Groups that spend time with each other and not with the other groups. You can think of it a little like demographics. You know, there's your zip code, you live there, the people in that zip code have a certain average wage, you know, there's so many kids per family, blah, 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 blah. So these are behavioral demographics. There are people like those green dot people. You know, they go to the places with the green dots and they hang out with other people that are sort of like them. But they don't go to the rest of the city very much at all. So if you ask, you know, where do people spend time, this is a map of where people spend time. So this is all done from anonymous data, and it's all aggregate. But now let me tell you another thing. The guys with the green dots have 10 times the risk of alcoholism of everybody else. Mm -hmm. well, OK, well, maybe that one is a little obvious, but you know, um, but, but, but the guys who are sort of the, uh, the reddish purple, they have five times the risk of diabetes. But we don't know why, because it's not like they go around doing some diabetes thing. It's just that, you know, their choices about what to eat, what to exercise, what to drink, are somehow biasing them. So that if you go and, and go to these locations and start interviewing people, you find this extremely hard Right, a diabetes. So these are like 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 um, demographics. I said we're all not concerned about demographics. We're all familiar with zip codes and zip code plus four, right? Our society runs on this. Well, this is the same type of aggregate data. 
But let me just sort of point out that with this sort of data, if I go to one of those green points, I know that uh, those people are very likely to be alcoholic, regardless of what they look like. If you look at their official data, they don't look very different from everybody else. But they have this high rate of alcohol. So I will try to be feeding for you. You go there, will How about the diabetes? Right? There's a place for diabetics, so I know that the higher income for myself, my health costs could be less. This is the aggregate data, right? There's nothing, no privacy, no PII, right? Just pointing out that, you know, you could do interesting things. But at the same time, if you were going to intervene with diabetes or alcoholism, you're going to do real public health that works, this is what you need to know. Okay? So killing the whole population is, is, is like boiling the ocean. If you know where the people are, you can go and convince them to change behavior, to get screened, or whatever. You need to know so, so there's a tension. This is another thing. So I'm on the uh, advisory board for Telefonica, and I help convince them they own O2, which is the wireless carrier in, in England. And um, I convince them to release uh, the company data about where people go, along with crime data and a bunch of other data. So their company data is basically how many people are using this cell tower this hour, okay? And where is those people's home billing address? What cell tower does that correspond? So what you can get out of that is you can say, well, there's 46 people that are from Ipswich here at 12 o'clock, and then it goes down to 43 at 1 o'clock. You don't know that they're the same people. You don't know which people they are. It's really very, very long. You cannot pick the back to these people. But what you can do is you can tell whether or not there'll be a lot of crime in that area in the future. You can predict crime rates in the future with considerable accuracy. And the answer is, um, if you see a place that has a diverse set of visitors, people from all over, and suddenly it stops being as diverse, so the guys from Ipswich or whatever stop coming, that's a little part of a neighborhood that has social stress. If the elders stop coming, a different sort of stress. When you see those sort of social stress, one of the most common things that happens along with that is crime. So I like to joke, when you see these sort of changes in population, you should send a social worker and a cop. Right? It's going to be one of those two things. But that's pretty amazing. So this is not personal data, again. Not a privacy issue. This is a bigger issue about what things you want to make visible and take action. So, I'm going to go here, save all that. We did the same thing in the Ivory Coast. Now, the Ivory Coast is a little different because they just had a civil war. Um, so what you're getting is ethnic views. And what you're getting is, where is the ethnic violence going to occur? Well, <laughs> that's a little more controversial. But at the same point, uh, the argument there is that you ought to know that if you're going to address ethnic violence, right? I mean, you could just close your eyes, you know, in which case you'll have another civil war and, you know, the Hutus and Tutsis will die again and so forth. But, you know, if you publish this, some people are going to use it for good, some people are going to use it for good. Very different, right? Um, we did a uh, thing with the Ivory Coast where we got the government and the local carriers at large to release this sort of uh, aggregate data. And we got uh, academic groups from all around the world, more than 100, um, uh, maybe actually ended up uh, submitting papers to see what you could do. And, and you could do things like map math, math the boundaries. You could also improve the commute time by rearranging the buses correctly. Um, so nobody ever knew where folks lived and where they worked, and now with this sort of big data, you can do that. Right? Same thing with public health system. Knowing where people move tells you where infectious disease problem is. You can do that malaria, you can do it with Ebola. Sort of interesting what you can do. Now, as what I've tried to give you is a sense that this sort of world of big data, mostly people talk about bad things. But there are actually a lot of really fundamental good things. And, and you don't see them so much in Washington, D.C. If you 
spent a lot of money on public health and health care. Um, so we've got them at least sort of under control. But for, you know, eight, nine, eight tenths of the human population, something like that, <laughs> there is no way that. Um, so for most of the world, you know, you get something like Ebola happening, a lot of people die. The capital city hears about it a few months later. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, this last fall, uh, at uh, the request of the UN Secretary General, I helped put together a report with some of the National Statistical Offices called a World Account. And I think it's really interesting reading because of what it says. We have a moral duty to use this big data to find out where people are dying. Because we don't know. So where are the income stuff? Where is the ethnic violence? Where is the inequality? Where is the genocide going? We don't know. But we can know because there are telephones on the internet and there's data from that. Increasingly, there are credit cards or you know, things on phones that do payments, electronic methods of doing things. And so you can x-ray society in ways that give you pretty much real-time readings of what's going on in a way that is fairly comparable to the sort of data that we have here, and in some cases, much better than the data that we have here. And so what this report and what the UN is adopting is a set of recommendations for every national statistical office in the world to begin measuring 169 different societal performance sets that have to do with income mortality, gender discrimination, uh, income inequality, uh, you know, crime rates, etc., using these sort of big data techniques. And I think that it represents a real sea change. But as I just tried to point out also, there's a lot of interesting ethical questions in there too. The real interesting ethical question come when you haven't got a benevolent government, like listening to the conversation here, everybody assumes the government are the good guys. What happens when it's a sod, right? Well, maybe you don't have to worry about that, but a lot of people do. Uh, imagine that you were 15 years ago in Rwanda, and they said, well, let's see. These public databases tell us where all the Tutsis are. Now, instead of killing 800,000 of them, it would have been several million of them. Would have died. Right? We don't think it can happen here. Right? Ladies from Germany, there, and they're educated that it can happen. Um, so, with that, sort of hopefully um, get you thinking about stuff. Um, some of the other things, and I have to walk the time, so I'm going a little slow. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about technology. Um, uh, so, one of the things that we talked about and we had in the last panel here was no sort of anonymized data. And we just had a, a, a paper in science, which is this paper. Um, but what it basically showed is that for most of the new sorts of big data we're getting, which are very high dimensional, things like location, there's a lot of locations you can be. Anytime there's data that has lots of different things, it turns out that data and the notion of privacy is completely different than the ones you're familiar with. It works really different. So we have HIPAA, we have a lot of privacy things. Turns out the current privacy things are silliness when it comes to this big data. You can break anonymous data almost always and it's easy. Okay? If it's high dimensional. In other words, the complexity of the data, the number of different alternatives at each stage is large. When you get that, it takes just a few extra pieces of data to re-identify any one person and all of their data in the, in the, the uh, large place. But it scales very nicely. You do the whole country. You know, you pick people out of the country. So that should concern you because most of the medical system is based on anonymization. Okay. It's sad. Um, it leads to a, a different sort of way of thinking about things where um, you need to have a really different way of thinking about how you're going to share data and make things happen. Uh, so anonymized data should only be shared with strong legal protection and water rights, which means you can tell where it came from in case somebody leaks it. Uh, personal data, with 1%, we'll talk about that. And aggregate data, 
is the one that seems to be the safest. So that's when you get more than varies from country to country. But you know, 15, 25 people in a cell, and you say, here's the mean of that cell. The average age is so and so. Um, that seems to be pretty safe in terms of privacy, as long as you don't connect the cells. The moment you connect the cells, all bets are off. Now I can re-identify things really easy. Okay, so if I can talk about how you went between zip codes, I can mail you all the time. Okay. Anyway. Um, so about six years ago, I started, uh, because I was involved in this, I started a group at Davos, which consisted of people like the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Commission of the EU, and uh, the heads of major corporations to sort of talk about, okay, what are we going to do? And my suggestion is we needed a new deal on data. And uh, that really, basically, uh, my suggestion was that people have the rights of ownership. So rights, not actual ownership. Um, so in English common law, ownership has the rights of possession, control, and disposition. And, and that's what I suggested. Basically, the way to think about this is that today, as you go around your life, you have this digital footprint, this digital identity that says so much about you. I'll show you a little bit more about that. I can tell whether you're depressed, I can tell whether you're sick, I can tell your personality better than your friends can, I can tell if you're going to get into um, financial trouble. And it's not the content, it's the metadata. It's your patterns of behavior out in the world. Who do you talk to? When do you talk to them? How much do you talk to them? Those sorts of things. That's your digital identity. And guess what? You don't even know it's there. And even if you did, it doesn't do any good because you don't own it. <laughs> the government owns it, companies own it. I mean, that, most of these guys are not out to get you. Don't be too worried, right? And um, some people just say, oh, I've learned much more about the government than I do. I, I have never seen a company engage in, in mass genocide. I've seen many countries engage in that. Okay? So, put it on the scale, right? But this was the, the suggestion, and interestingly, this leads to a deal that companies are willing to buy. So, pay attention if you don't like it. <laughs> right? So, the idea is, is that companies would own aggregate data, the stuff of like how many people are in my cell phone, but they would not own anything about your personal data. You, as a consumer, would get a license to the company to do a specific thing. That gets rid of all these terms and conditions that you sign where you can't tell what's going on. Specific service. And, and companies are willing to do that because they, the ones that have the most valuable data are heavily regulated. Currently, it's dangerous for them to do anything. One of the reasons that sharing data is so hard in medicine is that the financial interest of the hospital the doctors are all against it. Right? They don't hold on to it. But, you know, what this says is it's not your data anyhow. It's the consumer's data, it's the patient's data, it's the person's data. Right? And they should be the place which determines how they to get shared through a process of informed consent. And what we heard about here a lot is informing people is difficult because it's complicated. Um, and so the suggestion that I have and other people have is, is that we need to have, like we have in the banking system, which is agents for people that have to do this. So I don't invest my money or return my money directly. I give it to Fidelity. Fidelity, you know, has a fiduciary responsibility to do a good job, and I can take my money out at any time, and they get audited by the government. I think somebody should help me with my personal data, too and also with my medical data. So there would be, you know, maybe it's AARP. You know, maybe you're a member of a church group and you want your church group to do it. I don't know, that's up to you, right? Uh, but, you know, somebody who helps you navigate all of these permissions and the ramifications. So this is complicated. But the fundamental thing is that they would be asking for you the way a lawyer does, the way you're telling the way you're doing. And they would help you do this. And because they could aggregate over lots of people, they would have the power to be able to push corporations and even government into respecting a lot of the things. That's the, the, the idea. 
Let me give you just a sense of some of the things that you can do. And this is a, a spin-off. I'm going to stop for just a minute. This is a spin-off from my group. Um, and I'm not holding this up as the best thing ever, but it's illustrative. So this is a thing called Ginger I.O. And what we discovered a few years ago was that you could tell when someone was getting sick before they knew they were getting sick. You could tell when someone was getting depressed before they were seriously depressed because their behavior changed. So we did this, you know, in a you know medical experiment with human subjects, you know, approval and all that sort of thing. We gave phones to everybody in a community and you know, had them fill out forms all the time and stuff like that. And you could do a pretty good job, about eighty percent accurate. Um, and what you can do with that, and what is being done now, is Kaiser Permanente, which is the largest vertically integrated health service in the United States, uh, uses this for their um, chronic care patients. So people who are at great risk of uh, the comorbidity of depression or other sorts of uh, problems, the doctor says, you should probably use this so that we can keep track of you and get to you soon. Because, as Todd Park said, this has the ability to really change the health system. Currently, you know, Kaiser Permanente looks out, it's got millions of people that it's trying to manage. It knows that thousands of them are getting really seriously ill right now, and it won't see any of those people for months. Because they have to get so sick that they come in, you know, to the doctor or the ambulance or something like that before Kaiser Permanente even hears them. Well, by that time, not only are they going to be really hard to cure, but they're going to be really expensive. Wouldn't it be good if you knew when they were getting sick, if you had like a check engine light? Right? So, you know, like, ooh, ooh, I guess I am acting a little weird. Maybe I'm getting sick. Let me check. Right? Um, that's what they use it for, and the economic things are amazing. If you can get to people early, it's dramatically cheaper. Right? And, of course, the people get better health care. <laughs> we need to cure things early and not, not so late. So that's, that's ginger. It's sort of interesting, but there's this question of all this behavioral data. Who owns that data? It's being used by a health care system who invests in these things, but who owns it? Well, one of the good side effects of HIPAA is that data like this isn't in the HIPAA system. You can make it HIPAA compliant, but that is called risk on the doctor's part. So, in fact, the way this is set up is so that the patient owns the data. The patient controls the data. The patient shares the data when the patient wants to. Right? And so, you can collect data about yourself all you want. Nobody's too worried about that. You can see your data. You can delete your data if you want to. But one of the things you can do is you can decide to share uh, with your doctor, you go to talk to them, or you can share the check engine light. You say, oh, well, something's wrong. Right? But it's putting the patient at the center. And increasingly, this type of data is going to be important in healthcare. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is set up research this way, because imagine that you had millions of people collecting data about themselves. A little like patients like me, but rather than having to type it in, it's just automatically collected and they all get to look at it. But now I could do something like ask, you know, we're doing a little experiment more the people. Uh, we'd like to know if this sort of behavior uh, predicts this sort of outcome. I would find out why some of these guys have uh, high risk to diabetes. And what would happen? Well, they'd have to have informed consent. But actually, what they end up doing is clicking the button after they sort of read about it and decided to do it. Which means you could do that research in half a day, millions of subjects, years of data, and you can answer a question. Now, that compares with dumb medical research. But again, getting it through the process in less than a couple of years is really hard. The idea of actually being able to do medical research at a high frequency across large numbers of people is, is pretty transformative. So let me just uh, say one or two more things. We've built software that does this, of course. Uh, an interesting thing is that DARPA, which is the Defense Against Research Project Agency, just announced the Brandeis program. And it's to take what we've built, basically, and build it up to professional scale as an open source resource. What that means 
the subtext of that is, is that the U.S. DOD has decided that having personal data stores and greater privacy is necessary for their mission. And the reason we were able to build some of this is that they were concerned about I mean, like the VA, you know, soldiers and their families um, that they weren't sharing data and they had a crappy medical system, right? And they wanted to be able to do better. So, so they're putting a 60 million bucks into building personal data stores to put soldiers and their families at the core of the medical system. Which is worse, but you know, you can take the code and do other things to it too, if you want. So, you want to do that. A couple of little quick things. One is, we talk about sharing data. Generically, that's stupid. Um, what you want to do is you want to share answers. So if you have a bunch of data about you, and I'm doing some research, or I want to do something, I don't have to see your data. I just have to be able to ask a statistical question about it and get a certified answer. And it turns out that that certified answer is a lot less sensitive than the raw data. Because if you give me every place you've been, I can tell all sorts of stuff about you that you don't really want to share. If I ask, you know, were you in this place where there was an outbreak or whatever, that's much less sensitive. So, so it turns out if you look at the systems that banks use to share data, they typically don't share data. They share it Do you have enough money to satisfy this bill? Yes. We'll give you all the accounts and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. And, and then they have a legal contract between the day. So if you have enough money, and the other guy says yes. And by choosing to answer in a particular way, that establishes a legal contract. And it's a contract law. You don't need to have new uh, legislation. And what that does is that establishes a contract to move that amount of data from here to there. And we don't want to go to everybody takes money. There's a lot of that. It's really interesting to think about it. They often think about either legal solutions alone or technical solutions alone, but actually the two together are much more powerful. Anyway, um, one more thing because it's important, and this is Washington. So when Snowden revelations came out, Ash Carter said, there were two things that we did to reverse, okay? You might think that the first one was not giving permissions to somebody like Snowden. But that was not what he said. What he said is the big thing was sticking all the data in one place. When you stick all the data in one place, that lets the bad guys know where to go. Right? It's a honeypot. You will lose that data. And if you start losing it, you lose everything. Because it's all in one place. And that was sort of the story of Snowden. Once you're there, you could do everything. The question to ask yourself is how many other people like Snowden were there that didn't speak up? Right? You can bet that there were more. And so leaving data where it's collected, under the control of the people that collected it, and having careful permissions to combine is safer for the security agencies, for the defense, for homeland security, and for you. And I think that's a basic lesson. Tributed systems are better than something like So these sorts of things. Um, we build test beds. Get real people trying to live in the future. So we, we this one's from Trento uh, in Italy, where real people are living, using our software to be able to do, uh, see what it's like to have these new rules. That's it. In that way, you can learn how to change the risk reward for sharing because you want to have data sharing. Data sharing is how we get better science, better health, safer communities greener communities, more transparency in government, accountability in government, but you have to have the right data sharing. It has to be worth the risk that you have. So one way of doing that is to reduce the risk. And make it more so anyway, have a look. You can read more about not so much the privacy stuff. It's in there, a couple chapters about it, but all the sort of different things that we know about people in society using big data uh, and hopefully give you a, a somewhat broader view of things to talk about. <laughs> okay? Thank you.
So we're going to have a couple questions. Or what's, the, what's the plan? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ross Kapow, University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hi. So thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, two comments and a question. There's consent and then there's consent forms. So when I signed the license to Microsoft, uh, somebody just counted it. It's the same length as McDeath. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but more complicated. Yeah, yeah, well, and certainly less interesting. Um, <laughs> but when I read Macbeth, I don't sign away all my data. Yeah. Um, all the perfume. But anyway, um, the point is that we have these consent forms that are so opaque, and the whole process is so difficult. Yeah. Even when I sign on for you know Angry Birds, I'm basically telling them everything I ever do. Was crazy. Yeah. Uh, I it just not why they have to know where I am when I'm doing. It. And that relates to my second comment, which is um, I'm not sure I want my phone to let me know that my data suggests that I'm depressed. Um, I, 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 that, that's depressing. And, um, and, and also, uh, I, I study people's workarounds in use of computer systems in healthcare IT, and I may be tempted to give my phone to my dog to run around to make me look less depressed, uh, and also make my doctor. But and dog will be more healthy then, right? Yeah. No, I'll be more healthy. Just look at my phone. Um, my last point is just a comment on genocide and corporations versus the country. And of course, you're, you're generally right, but I think under genocide, we'd have to count, you know, uh, McDonald's, U.S. Tobacco, Chevron, sure. a couple of others. That, you generalize it, then it yeah. becomes a lot, lot less but clear. Thank yeah. you for wonderful. <laughs> McDonald's still doesn't have guns, right? So, um, yeah, they don't need them. That's good. <laughs> so, so, informed consent is one of these things where, and particularly in Europe, informed consent is a problematic thing because there's much less. Uh, tradition of that, uh, which surprised me. Um, but, uh, and you're right, of course, about these complicated things. So, informed consent should mean that the person is actually informed. And your point about the Microsoft thing is, is it, I don't know what that means. They don't really either. I uh, just give them a license to screw around with, right? Um, and so, two things. One is, is that you know, if you say informed consent, you have to know what that means. And, and the two parts. One is um, agreeing to specific services, but not other things, so that you can say what's actually going to happen. Um, the other thing is, is there needs to be uh, sort of standards that are widely accepted in society that everybody understands the are. And they're not going to understand the details. But, you know, I understand that if I give my money to a bank, that I can get my money back, right? And that it's reasonably safe, <laughs> maybe. Well, as long as I don't go over $100,000, right, or whatever the FDIC thing is, I should be able to get it back. But there's probably lots of asterisks in there. But generally, people understand that, okay? So that's a norm that's been created, and that, that assumes a lot of this. So one of the important things is this norm creation and education process whereby everybody comes to understand what are the different types of deal you can have with data, which ones are good, when. Okay? And that should be what people do. It's still going to be complicated, and I still want someone to represent it. Right? Maybe give you insurance to it or something like, you know, and I think there's lots of people like Fidelity and stuff that would be really something to do that. In terms of not knowing about stuff, I mean, that's your choice not to, to know about stuff. But, um, you know, when it gets to be something serious, um, you know, I think that, I mean, it's, you know, I'm not going to go there. But, um, you know, when you have something that's potentially fatal, you want to know about it. You ought to have the option to know about it. You know? Depression is one of these completely underappreciated things in our society. Huge numbers of people get it. It causes huge numbers of deaths. More importantly, it causes comorbidity. 
And so, you know, it's among the many, many um, sort of uh, assessments of public health around the world, Dowry's, you know, disability adjusted life expectancy attributable to depression is the number one thing beyond heart disease and stuff like that. Because it happens young, it happens often, it's severe, it's comorbid, it's other. So I, I don't know, I could, I could argue with you, I'm not going to do it here, but I could argue with you about the depression, right? Because it's a, it's a really endemic problem in our society, and our attitudes are, first of all, we don't have a way to assess it, a private, personally agreeable way to do it. And second of all, it's this huge problem that's so underappreciated. We have done some stuff like that. We did return the soldiers on PTSD. And what we did is we gave them the software, and we allowed them to see how they compared to other people in their patrol who had also returned. So you get the sense of whether you feel like crap, but does everybody feel like crap? Or are you just somehow out of bounds? And what we found is almost everyone would share their data with the other guys in their patrol. Not everybody, but some of them. Almost nobody would share their data with their spouse. <laughs> okay? Some share the data with us. And so, you know, and I have to feel pretty good about that, right? Um, that people were smart enough to know that they're in it together and that they could reach out. And, and that sort of social thing, I think, is a really underexplored uh, avenue for these categories of disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I apologize for asking a question which I could easily understand you wanting to duck. It's very specific. Uh, the previous panel was very deep. The p uh, yeah. panel was very deep in both uh, the, the, the depth of experience on the panel and how they talked about it. Uh, it's a very major effort. A lot of money is being set up to uh, set up this network. Uh, like you said, it's a qualitative uh, uh, difference. And your expertise is in networks to create uh, learning healthcare systems or whatever the uh, catchphrase might have been. Uh, but it's also in technology. Uh, so uh, what is your reaction to the way our system, uh, you know, the ACA, the government, whatever you want to call it, has set up something like PCORNET specifically where their attempt is to get people, the patients, very involved in the architecture of the network itself. Uh, that, that's their claim, right? That's what the answer was to the, to the respondent. Uh, can you say anything about that without... Well, I know I'm pretty on the spot. Things. I mean, one is it sounded good. I don't know the detail. It sounded right-headed to me. I think maybe the software we developed could be useful in helping it accomplish its, its goal. I know I have talked to um, I mean, the, people who, like the chief data scientist for the United States, right, who's very focused on this sort of stuff. And um, the key difficulty is, is the incentives in our current health system are not set up for data sharing at, at many levels and in many places. Uh, uh, I'm not smart enough, I don't know if anybody's smart enough to really fix that, but we do have to have some greater liquidity of data so that you know, there are a lot of answers in there that, that could really be transformative for healthcare, um, but you can't get at them today. And I think that if we you know, focus on this and sort of push them, we may be able to get there. Um, Fortunately, people seem to understand that it has to be patient-centric. I actually don't like the word patient-centric because I'm a patient, but I'm also a person, and I think I'm a person first. A person-centric is the thing I would prefer, but that's a middle. Um, so, so the sort of thing I talked about where people collect data about themselves and then choose to share it under various circumstances is the sort of way I, I prefer it. And, I see things pushing in that direction, but I see a lot of entrenched interest uh, pushing back. And uh, we'll just keep working on it, I guess, is the thing to say. And the interesting thing, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, one more thing is we get. Um, the discussion is very US centric. 
um, there are other places that are not only doing it better, um, like for instance, Switzerland has a co-op system for personal data and medical data. Amazing. You know, that would be so transformative in the United States. And it's, and it's not like that from a third world country, right? Um, India, because real healthcare systems are new there, has the sort of healthcare data that we can only dream about. It's uniform, it's transparent, it's unified, right? So I'm interested in getting hold of some of that to be able to ask, what could you do with that? if you sort of open the scope and begin asking how you can transform stuff. So you may see places like India or China really transforming the system. And in such a famous places like Switzerland, uh, which are very sympathetic to us, they're similar in many ways, have already made really major steps. And I think that's inspiring. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much.